to Mark 10, verses 35 to 52. Continue to pick up with the story of Jesus. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left hand in your glory. And Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called to them and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great officials exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. And whoever should be great among you must be your servant, and whoever be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. The word of the Lord. So I look around the room this morning, and I see that some of you have vision problems because you're wearing eyeglasses, right? There are others here that I probably don't know you have a vision problem because you're wearing contacts. Matter of fact, many people don't know that I wear contacts. If they just come on Sunday morning and only see me on Sunday morning, they wouldn't know that I have contacts. But you know, uh, matter of fact, as I'm, I'm reading scripture and everything, like the pictures in the slide here, you see some of them, they're all out of focus, right? It is hard to read. Wrong focus can be blinding, isn't it? Some of you are struggling. Yeah, I can see they're stretching their neck and trying to figure it all out. My vision's a little bit blurry, too, as I'm reading scripture. I'm looking forward to the eye doctor appointment next month so we can uh, adjust the contacts. Because you know what happens is when your eyes are out of focus, it's draining. It's fatiguing. It's frustrating when you can't read something clearly. Life is not fun when things are out of focus. That, things like that are really one of your frustrations. If you're a lover of photography like I am, it doesn't seem like I get to do enough of it, but you know, I'm used to the old manual cameras, and, and you had to sit there, and you'd adjust it, and you know, you think you just got the right picture, and it's in focus, and then you get the slide or the film back later, and what? Man, it was out of focus, and it's really frustrating. And you get annoyed by it. Well, camera manufacturers realized all of a sudden that this was hurting their sales and uh, photography as a habit wasn't hobby and person's lifestyle habit was not growing. So you know what they quickly did? They created autofocus lenses. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about whether it's focusing, right? The camera will do it all for you. The idea is really to give you a clear image of what you're looking at, to create an image that will bring back good memories. There's a snapshot of my life over the years, from my bride to grandchildren to weddings to trips to Greece and Turkey to England to the coast 
to a couple of animals we have. No, we didn't own a bison. You see a bison there, right? We didn't own a bison. <laughs> when we were moving out here, we were stopped at Yellowstone Park, and Ethan was nine, and all of a sudden he jumped out because he had to go pet the bison. I don't think I've ever run that fast in my life. So we have all these memories. And that's what the idea of a good, crisp, clear image is supposed to do. Help you remember good times. But like our eyes or our camera, our spiritual walk, too, can get blurry. We can start having a wrong focus. And that wrong focus can also lead us to blindness. It was true of Jesus' disciples. And if we're honest, it's true with us. Jesus is teaching here again in this passage. He's, he's literally repeating himself. This is the fourth time we can document that he's telling his disciples, we're going to Jerusalem, here's what's going to happen. This is the purpose of God. This is the reason why I came into the world. And by the way, let me just remind you of something I've said over and over and over again to you. I'm going to remind you. Anytime God repeats himself, it's because it's important. Listen well when God's repeating himself. Because he wants you to hear what he has to say. So there's Jesus with God's plan. The context just before what we read. See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. Yes and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. And there he is, Jesus is saying, I'm determined, I'm going to Jerusalem. He says it in a command form. He is focused. Nothing is going to derail him from getting to Jerusalem. Nothing is going to sidetrack him and distract him from what God has called him to do. It's God's purpose for his life. And he's going to do it. And once again, Mark says that the disciples, that is the 12, were astonished. And the crowds following Jesus didn't understand and were afraid. Well, at least Mark says in a couple chapters later here, that the disciples have gone from not understanding to at least still being astonished. Maybe there is some growth and hope for them, right? They're having a hard time following and understanding the mysteries of God. In their minds, it made no sense. Jesus was a Messiah figure. He could become king. Let's have a political overthrow. But why would anyone betray him? Why would anyone want to flog, beat, mock this compassionate teacher who is an outstanding, a compassionate healer who is an outstanding teacher. Why would anyone want to do that? And the crowds were perplexed. And the disciples are still uh, scratching their heads. What does he mean? They still don't get it. And there's a lot of theories. There's a lot of things we could go through, why they didn't get it, and the commentators down through the generations have written that. But I want to ask you this simple question. Were they just simply distracted by something else? Were they distracted by something else? Distractions have a way of preventing us from thinking clearly and deeply. Distractions have a way of muddying up our thinking and getting us out of focus so we really don't see the total picture. So the distractions can help you lose your focus and your vision becomes blurry. Matter of fact, we know from life, right, life experiences, when all of a sudden you're distracted by something else is usually when an accident occurs, right? How many people have been seriously hurt at work because they got distracted by something? How many of you have made a wrong turn and gone the wrong direction because all of a sudden you were distracted by something? And that happens in our life. So here comes the brothers James and John, the sons of Zebedee, or otherwise known as the sons of thunder. Yay. And they walk up to Jesus 
to make their request. Hey, Jesus, will you do what we ask you to do? And he says, what is that? He said, they said, can one of us sit at your right hand and one of us sit at your le- right hand and one of us sit at your left hand? Can, can we do that? You know, earlier Mark had given us the inside scoop, right? That this conversation has already happened a few weeks before this incident. Maybe even as much as a couple months. The 12 had been walking down the road behind Jesus and they had been having a whisper campaign. They were trying to tell each other who was the greatest of the disciples. Who was Jesus' favorite? Who had the most influence? Who would have the most prominence in, in the life ahead? I mean, come on, Peter, James, and John had been at the Transfiguration. They, they had the upper hand in this. They thought they were really special because they were there for that. And all of a sudden, this competition has become really fierce. And James and John make a preemptive strike. They go directly to Jesus. And they start asking for favored places. Jesus is teaching them about the next moments in time in the next few days when all of history will be rewritten, when the world will be forever changed and transformed. He's talking about how he as the Son of God, Messiah, will suffer and die for them, just like Isaiah said. And he will be that suffering servant. And in his death, there will be resurrection, and he will ascend to heaven and sit at right hand of God the Father, and all of history will have been transformed and changed The world will never be the same again. This transformation plans to be glorious. It's going to be wonderful. And there's Jesus teaching this, and the disciples are stuck in their ambition, and everything is going in one ear and coming out the other side. All because they're distracted in their ambition. They they have this need to be honored this need to be recognized as important. Their pride was in full bloom. The drive to succeed, by the way, enters all of us. And when our ambition takes over and our pride grows, we do everything we can for self-preservation. We try to preserve our ideas and our agenda. We want to preserve our will, our way of life, our plans, our goals. By the way, just so you know, ambition has an appetite that can never be satisfied. Ambition can also blind us. Because in ambition, we no longer see a true goal. We see a self-important goal. I mean, think about some of the wealthiest people in the world. They always want something more, right? They're always trying to grow their businesses. They're trying, ambition still is driving them. John D. Rockefeller was once asked, Mr. Rockefeller, how much money is enough? You got to remember, by today's standards, he made Bill Gates and Warren Buffett look like paupers with the wealth he had accumulated through Standard Oil. Rockefeller looked at the questioner and he answered this, one dollar more, (laughs) one dollar more. Ambition has a way of eating away at your soul and eating away at who you are. It has a way of making you feel more important. John Stott writes this, that in our world, And believe it or not, even in the church, there are lots of Jameses and Johns, go-getters, status seekers. They hunger for honor and prestige. They measure life by achievements and everlasting dreams of success. The news is full of preachers who, who are so driven by success that they implode on their churches and hurt lives. They're always seeking something else. James and John were looking at discipleship and following Jesus as something where they could obtain prestige and rank. 
They, they assumed that following him, they could achieve some things. And, and we give them a place of status and a place of importance and a place of honor. And before we throw them under the bus, isn't that often what we're looking for? Because I have this question for you. How many of us do good things in the community for the recognition that we will receive by doing the good things? How many? Or are we just willing to go serve because that's what needs to be done? Because there's people who need us to serve them. You see, when we allow ambition and pride and self-importance to be the driving emphasis of our lives, we lose focus. Because what it's really doing is putting us before others. And there they are, the inner circle of Jesus, the twelve, not fully grasping everything that Jesus had been teaching them. Why? Because they were distracted. They were so worried about trying to get their place in the kingdom set up and their importance in the kingdom of God that they weren't hearing the most life-changing message that Jesus Christ was offering them. That there is a new world coming. There's a new day coming. So Jesus looks at James and John, and he says to them, what can I do? And they, can you do what I do? Can you go through the baptism that I am going to go through? Can you suffer through the things I'm going to have to suffer through, is really what he's saying. And they, in their self-confidence, on full display, yeah, we can, we're able. Pride at its height. Now, the other 12 hear the conversation, and now all of a sudden they're indignant, they're irate. They are really royally ticked off. Now, the question I have for you is, are they ticked off by the question that James and John asked Jesus, or are they ticked off because they didn't get to Jesus first? Because my bet is more on the second than the first. They were just upset. So Jesus, again, summons them together to have the same conversation he's had with them before, and he reminds them that he came into the world and his followers need to serve others because the Son of Man came to serve people, even give his life as a ransom for many. And what he's saying to them is, if you're going to be a follower of me, are you willing to give up your life for the sake of the kingdom? Are you willing to give up your life for other people? Because if you want to serve Jesus, you have to serve others. Now, some of us have no problem serving others. If they look like us, they live in the neighborhood community like us, they wear the right cologne so they smell like us. But do we love the street person who struggles with alcohol? Or drug addiction, and they smell like they haven't showered in months, and they ask for our help, do we help them? Are we willing, are we willing to do ministry that goes out and helps them? If they walk into our church seeking help, would we greet them with open arms and love them the way Jesus would love them? You see, Paul reminds us of this. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with a sensible mind, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. We need to stop thinking about ourselves as more important than other people. We need to put others first. In his book, Humilitas, John, Dickens, John Dixon writes this. Humanity is the noble choice to forgo your status, deploy your resources, or use your influence for the good of others before yourself. Forgo, forgo your status. Forget about your importance. Forget about your self-importance. And think of others. 
do good for them. The disciples are clearly missing this because they are focused on the distraction. Their vision has become wrong because all they're thinking about is their future status. And they're missing what Jesus is teaching them. They're missing, too, how he is demonstrating the kingdom of God and the principles of the kingdom of God by the compassionate way he puts the needs of other people first. So the journey continues to Jerusalem. Mark continues to illustrate this very principle we've been talking about because I think there's a reason why the Holy Spirit had Matthew, Mark, and Luke put this next story about the blind beggar right behind the story about Jesus correcting his disciples about their wrong vision. Because there's Jesus with the crowds following him once again, leaving the city of Jericho. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke say there was a blind man. Mark dignifies him by telling us his name, saying it was Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus is there at the side of the road, blind. And he hears that Jesus is nearby, and so he starts crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd moves in around him and tries to hide him, and somebody hits him on the shoulder and says, oh, you shut up. Nobody wants to hear you. So he cries out even louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. And now some of the crowd are really indignant. They're pushing at him, shoving at him. They're trying to tell him to be quiet. And he yells again, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And they're in the midst of his agenda, heading to Jerusalem to carry out the will of the Father, to do really good ministry that will change the world, Jesus stops. And all of a sudden, he takes the time, and he turns, and he looks into the crowd, and he tells them, call him to me. And all of a sudden, the people are saying, hey, hey, Bartimaeus, he wants to talk to you. And Bartimaeus throws off his coat and gets up and runs to Jesus. Jesus took the time from his busy agenda to talk to a person in need. So Jesus says to him, what do you want me to do? Rabbi, I want to see. And Jesus says, go, your faith has healed you. And immediately the sight was restored. Immediately this man could see. And then Mark tells us, he didn't run home to his family to celebrate. He starts following Jesus. By the way, when Jesus does something big in your life, and he starts to do something miraculously compassionate in your life, I think the only true response is to follow him. It's the right response. You see, Jesus had actually come into the world to defeat all those things that marred the beautiful creation that God had made. He came to restore things to their proper place. Part of his mission was to bring about healing to people. And this man's faith in Jesus, the belief that Jesus could heal, transformed and changed his life. And his sight was restored. Now, we don't know what caused this man's blindness, whether he was born this way or whether he had an accident and became blind. But there are certain things around our lives that can create spiritual blindness that start with a focus that gets blurry in a wrong focus direction that all of a sudden leads to spiritual blindness. And the first thing that is spiritually blindness in people is the fact that they're not a follower of Jesus Christ. That's just simple. You are spiritually blind if you are not a follower of Jesus Christ. By the way, our job is to tell others how they can find a new eyesight. Do you love people so that all of a sudden their sight can be restored? Now we're going to go to Medlin. Some people will not be happy with me today. That's okay. God's beat me up on this a few times, taking a four by four and straightened me out. Our love for the world starts to blurry our vision and lead to wrong focus. That is our indulgence for the things of this world. John later would write this, the same John would write this. 
Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The real question is, what is your allegiance to? What is your allegiance to? Is your allegiance to the material things that God has given you as a blessing? Or is your first allegiance to Jesus Christ? Who owns your heart? Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, you and I cannot serve two masters. We either love the money, the possessions, the material, or we love God. We all know this in real terms, right? If you're in a relationship with someone, the other person does not like it if you say that you love something else, someone else. Our spouses want our total devotion, our total allegiance. And I don't care what the world says about palimonious marriages, which are now becoming legal in some places in the United States. You can't love two people the same. You just can't. God didn't intend it that way. So who do you love? John comes along and says, again, and the world is passing away along with, all its, with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Those things that we often put our indulgence in and our allegiance in are just rusting away, Jesus says. Moth destroys them. They wear out. Now, hear me. I love my toys. I love my comfortable life. But I'll tell you, one time in my life, I was just driven to accumulate good things. I had to have the latest computer, the brightest, shiniest, fastest, and I was just driven by it. It was consuming. You know, I wanted the bigger paychecks and a bigger job so that what? I could have more toys. I, I had dreams of a certain size house and all this other stuff. I wanted the shiny stuff, the glitter. But then one day, Jesus took a four-by-four to my head and straightened me out. Seriously. He's worked on changing my heart so I understand this principle. While I enjoy my comfortable life, it does no longer owns me. Because what I want more and more every day, more than anything else, is more of Jesus in my life. I want more of Jesus. I'm not asking him to tell me to sell everything and leave my comfortable lifestyle. But I can tell you this. While I have it, I'll enjoy it. But if he asks me tomorrow to sell it all and go somewhere else to serve him and give that all up, it's been nice knowing you. Goodbye. Because my allegiance is to Christ alone. The love of the world draws us to the place where we are more focused on living in the here and now instead of in light of eternity. So we start allowing all these things to work on our life and we worry about what's happening in the very moment right now instead of what eternity looks like. Because I don't care what's happening in the political world. It could get really bad for us. It can go upside down in a heartbeat and maybe I'll wind up in jail because I believe in Jesus. But that's okay. A few of my friends, you of the saints have gone before me have been in jail before, right? Some have even died martyrs' deaths for believing in Jesus. Because I'm not looking really at what happens in the next three or four years completely. My hope is in what happens in eternity future when I'm with Jesus for the rest of my life, for the rest of my soul's eternity. So I leave my allegiance with Jesus. Because I'm starting to look at everything from eternity's perspective. The other thing that leads us to blindness, too, is our inflated view of self, my inflated view of self. Because all of a sudden, you start getting in this competitive mode where you look at the other person and you say, you know, hmm, I have a better theological education than them. I have better skills than they do. I think I preach better than them. How come their church is five times bigger? It's a God thing. It really is. But too many of us are consumed by that. We don't celebrate where God has us as a mission field because we are so caught up with ourselves and wanting recognition and the applause of people and the pats on the back that we lose focus on the mission and purpose that God has for us. 
Who has spoken? It does not matter if I'm more gifted than so-and-so down the street. What matters is am I doing with my gifts what I called to do at this moment and this time where God has asked me to serve? The disciples were missing that. And too often we in the church miss that too. We do it in our careers. We do it with our families. We do it in how we choose churches, where we attend. You know, another thing that leads to blindness is hanging on to hatred or bitterness instead of forgiving. When you and I hang on to the bitterness of the wrongdoing something has done to us, what we are doing is poisoning ourselves, and we're allowing them to have more control over us. And that just eats away at us, and it eats away at the point that all of a sudden we now have a wrong focus, and pretty soon we're spiritually blind, and we don't operate well anymore. When all Jesus says is forgive them. Can you forgive those who have brought harm to you? Are you willing to forgive those who brought harm to you? Thought for a moment about Jesus' life, and I decided there are a few things I saw in his life real quickly that I noticed that Jesus did that help him keep his focus. He was determined to go to Jerusalem. He was determined to carry out the will of the Father, and he did certain things. In the midst of um, all sorts of pride around him from the Pharisees and from rulers, of nations, Jesus demonstrated humility. Even when someone tries to pay him a compliment and say, good teacher, tell me this, he says, excuse me, only God is good. Jesus has this way of acting out in humility, so much so that Paul says later to the church at Philippi that Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but humbled himself, became obedient, even obedient unto death on the cross. And therefore, now he is highly exalted. He was acted in humility. He never read the press clippings and decided they were right. In the face of earthly power, when Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes were, were coming after him. And even when a Roman governor and a king ask him questions, he responds in wisdom. They ask him about paying taxes. And what does he say? You get to start of the whole riot. And he said, No, you give unto Caesar what is Caesar is, give unto God what is God. He seems to speak with wisdom. In the midst of lies and slander, he speaks truth. Matter of fact, John says that he came into the world, what? Full of grace and truth. One of the purposes of Jesus coming into this world is to bring the full display of God's grace and the full display of God's truth to bear on people's lives, to make it available to them. So he speaks truth. Even when others accuse him of being the son of the devil and a liar. How many of you would say to a religious leader, you're the follower of a liar. <laughs> Jesus didn't. Because <laughs> no matter how painful it was, he was willing to speak truth into someone's life for their good. In the, fate, in the face of distortion and hatred, being beaten and flogged and mocked, he loves people. Matter of fact, in the greatest statement of love, what does he do? Probably the greatest act of love that we could ever hear. There from the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He demonstrated love by dying on the cross. And he acted in compassion and mercy to the forgotten, the lonely, the broken, the lost, the hurting, the outcast. He treated them with kindness. He always seemed to speak to them with gentleness. 
and he was compassionate and merciful to them. That's how Jesus kept his focus. You see, when you get a little out of focus with your eyesight, what happens? You go to the eye doctor, right? Because you need this prescription. You either get better contacts or better eyeglasses. I just want to tell you, when it comes to your spiritual life, I know a doctor who has the great ability to cure your spiritual blindness, that he can refocus the blurry vision of your life and the wrong vision of your life, and his name is Jesus. And the first thing you need to do is you have to be honest with yourself and admit that you have a vision problem, that you have a wrong vision or a blurry vision, or maybe you're spiritually blind. And in acknowledging that blindness, acknowledging that illness, you go and seek help. And in that act of confession, what happens is you open up yourself to a whole new way of life. Because Jesus loves to wash away all the wrong in your life. And it's accountability in your life that's been charged against you. And you confess. And you get on the right page with him. What I've discovered is confession is freeing. The bondage that was enslaving me and holding me back and tying me down and making my life more difficult has been cut away, and I'm free. And that's a glorious feeling. Next thing you need to do is surrender your life. That is, you need to give your allegiance to Jesus. Allow Jesus to be the one in control of your life. And what that means is you have to surrender your self-pride and your self-importance. And you have to surrender your ambition and open your ears and listen to what God is saying in your life. But you need to surrender. It's not like you give Jesus a little bit, and I'm just going to hold on to this, Jesus, because I think that's what I did too often in my life, and maybe you do it. So I'll give you this part of my life, Jesus. But I just, I just want to keep this part. And when you give your allegiance to a true king, it's all in. And that's what Mark has been telling us throughout his gospel, that Jesus is calling us to follow him, to leave everything behind, and follow him. But I have another thing that thought crossed my mind this week and it became really clear to me yesterday as I was praying about the sermon. Will you allow the Holy Spirit to be the autofocus of your life? Let's go back to our camera illustration at the very beginning. You know, I used to sit there and used to adjust the camera and I'd play with it. And usually, by the, especially since I like to do scenics with animals, you know, the animal's in the perfect spot. And you're trying to get it in focus and what? He moves. Gone. Picture's gone. Autofocus has really helped with that. Because you know what autofocus does, right? You point the camera at the direction, the object that you're trying to record on film or record digitally now, and if you move it left or right, the camera refocuses quicker than you could ever think about it. Quicker than you could do it manually. But the only requirement is that the camera manufacturer said, get your hand off the lens. You know, we were taught always to hold our camera and we have it in the lens, you know, and we were adjusting it. You got to take this hand off the lens if you're right-handed. You just got to take it off. The question I have is, will you take your hand off your life and allow the Holy Spirit to be the autofocus of your life? Because I'm going to tell you, when you allow the Holy Spirit to be the autofocus of your life, that circumstance you're going through, that situation that wears you down, that problem you have, all of a sudden it's quickly adjusted to God's viewpoint and God's agenda. And all of a sudden, everything that you think is blurry and wrong focused all of a sudden becomes crystal clear as God reveals his purposes for that situation. And he starts to tell you how to deal with that situation. And it may not be an easy road, but it'll be a road he walks with you and through the difficulty with you. But it's going to be clear because the Holy Spirit is the one at every step of the journey automatically is refocusing your life to God's agenda and God's plan. The question is, will you allow the Holy Spirit to be that autofocus of your life? So I don't know what's causing your own spiritual blindness. I don't know what's causing you to have wrong focus or lack of focus for the most part. But I do know this. 
that today, no matter where we are, whether it be here in the worship center in Clay Elm or anywhere else throughout Facebook land on live streaming, Jesus is speaking to you, and he's asking this question. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? And my prayer is that many of you will say, Lord, cure me of my blindness, that I may see you in your glory and live every moment of the rest of my life in total allegiance to you, Jesus, King of Kings, that your glory was to be seen in me. And Lord, because of that, will others find you? Yes. My prayer is that's your prayer. That when God asks you today, what do you want me to do to you? You will respond. I want you to strengthen my life with your presence. Holy Spirit, be the autofocus of my life. And keep me with the right vision for your glory, God. Father God, we just ask that you'd meet us here today and you'd speak to us. Lord, I, I know at times we, um, I go out of my way to do things that just are wrong vision, they're blurry vision. And I just thank you that you're a God who corrects. So Lord, meet us here today, speak into our lives. Help us to have clear vision for us. That in everything we do, we may give you honor and glory and praise. Thank you, Jesus, for speaking to us today. In the name of Christ, amen and amen.